Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Air Force Association's annual Air, Space, and Cyber Conference and Trade Show, largest gathering of U.S. Air Force leaders from around the world to discuss the services strategy and future. Our coverage here is sponsored by Elbit Systems of America, L3 Technologies, and Leonardo DRS, and we're here at General Electric's uh, stand here to talk to Carl Sheldon, who is the Vice President and General Manager for GE's uh, large military uh, engines uh, business. Uh, Carl, um, you're in front of one of the world's most beautiful uh, airplanes, the B-52. Uh, eight engines and, and a lot of love. Uh, Air Force has been getting uh, discussing for pretty much forever about re-engining uh, the B-52. Uh, that's coalescing now to sort of move forward as a, as a program. Talk to us a little bit about what timelines we're, we're talking about. Um, there's a, there are a couple of other companies that are interested in bidding for this uh, as well, obviously, and not just Pratt & Whitney, but other companies as well. But talk to us a little bit about how you see this uh, time scale coming together and, and what the requirement's likely to ask for. Yeah. So what we know about the program today is it's, it's focused largely on sustainment, right? The purpose of re-engineering the B-52 at this point is for sustainment. Uh, the timeline, you know, the Air Force is still developing what that acquisition strategy looks like. I think sometime in the next few weeks there'll be a couple of key meetings where the Air Force finalizes that strategy. And at that point we would expect to see um, a little bit more clarity around the milestones of the timeline on how they want to proceed under what's going to be a rapid acquisition strategy, something non-traditional in this sense. Um, would expect an RFP you know, sometime in the, in the next year, probably looking at 2019, um, and a lot of the requirements that will go along with that, I think, are still under development. So still some work to do, but under rapid acquisition, we expect to see some in about a year. Um, anybody who knows anything about the jet engine business knows that you were in it from the very, very inception. The first uh, American jet engine was uh, a British design, but built by uh, GE that uh, uh, went into the America's first uh, first jet, uh, which uh, was, was a Bell product. Um, but talk to us a little bit, full disclosure, Bell is one of our sponsors. Um, talk to us a little bit about what are the two offerings, because you guys have two engines that could go into the airplane. Talk to us about both and the relative merits of each one. Sure, yeah, so we do have two offerings. Uh, both are of the thrust class and size that would fit on a B-52 being fan diameter um, and about 17,000 pound thrust class. And uh, first is the CF-34-10, right? So it is the engine that powers regional jets, uh, CRJs, Embraer's, and it's been around uh, in its commercial variant since the early 90s. Was actually started life as a TF-34 uh, years ago and then had a commercial development path that has led to the modern day CF-34-10 after decades of development. And it represents kind of the, the gold standard for reliability, maintainability, right? We've got over 26 million flight hours on that engine. So it's been out there in the field, it's proven. We know that engine, the industry knows that engine. And so that's kind of one bookend for reliability and sustainability. On the other end, we have a Passport engine, which will be released on the Global 7000 a little later this year, and it represents cutting edge technology, right? Fuel burn and performance at the pinnacle of that thrust class. Um, so, depending on how the, the requirements are going to trade off on, on that platform, GE's got an offering that could fit, fit both ends. Uh, and why uh, is it that, um you know, a lot, when you looked a long time ago, you know, it looked like they could, it would go to a four-engine configuration for this extraordinary eight-engine bomber with the coolest throttle quadrant on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, it's just eight eight throttles. I mean, that's, that's just it doesn't get any cooler. I suppose B36 would be the only cooler one because yeah, that was yeah. six turning, four burning, that's right? right. Uh, so I thought I'd throw that a little bit on you. That was a turbojet. That is old school retro. Absolutely. <laughs> that's old school. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm good at the old school. Um, uh, but talk to us a little bit about why the jet has to stay an eight engine jet and why you can't go to a four engine configuration. Yeah, so, so there have been a number of studies um, that suggest the eight engine configuration is, is the one to go with. A lot of work has been done by Boeing and the airframer and that's really where those requirements come from. And, and from what I understand on the, the four engine versus eight engine is, when it comes to weapons release envelopes and rudder authority on an engine out scenario and a number of different considerations that the airframer would make on that, the eight engine solution at the end of the day required less integration and configuration change to the, to the jet. And, and I think that's the name of the game here, right? The Air Force is looking for an off the shelf engine with the development on that engine already done and minimizing the impact and the change that they have to make to the B-52 and minimizing that integration and that risk. 
and that is an eight engine solution because you have to change the fewest amount of things if you stay with eight engines. If you go to four engines, you got to change a lot of other things in the whole dynamics of the weapon system, right. which is why I think we're ending up with an eight engine solution. And, and talk to us a little bit about how much nacelle, I mean, you know, uh, uh, folks, who are not in the airplane business don't recognize how intimate the, the engine, nacelle, pylon. Talk to us a little bit about how much of that stays the same, what has to change with either one of your offerings, because as you were saying, all of this is a flight affecting, drag inducing, et cetera, uh, delicate equation that goes into a very sophisticated jet. Even though it's from 1952 and sort of on a paper napkin, what, 1948 or yeah, something? Way back there, yeah. So so the, the key here is going to be to, you know, on, on the pod today as it sits, those engines are very close coupled, right? Those TF-33s, very close coupled. Um, turbojet, very streamlined, so you're able to put those engines together. Today's uh, turbofan engines generally have um, some more externals mounted on the outside, so you got to be very clever with the configuration and try and keep those engines as close coupled as possible. Um, yeah, because you now have bypass, and they really didn't have very much bypass. No, not, not bypass so much back in the day, but then the exhaust streams that come out of those pods today, right, can't interfere with the flaps in a landing configuration. So the idea is going to be to try and couple these things as close as possible, so the externals packaging the engine is going to be key. And um, what are some of the benefits, right? So talk to us from a fuel burn perspective, right? You said it's the TF-33, was a, was a mainstay engine, was in the C-141 fleet. I mean, you know, that engine was all over the Air Force at one point and, and also in, in commercial. Talk to us a little bit about what the fuel burn difference is from one of these new modern engines compared with what, you know, I mean, effectively was a late 1950s engine design. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, technology's come a long way, right? Uh, both from combustion technology, certainly bypass technology, aero technology. So what we expect is anywhere between a 20 and 30 percent um, increase or decrease in the fuel burn, which would translate to an increased range. But just, just by virtue of all the technology that's gone in those engines, between 20 and 30 percent you know, fuel burn benefit will be huge to the B-52 mission requiring fewer tankers to do that mission so those tankers can be deployed elsewhere. So the Air Force is going to get a couple of really big benefits out of this. They're in it for sustainment, but by virtue of, of pretty much any modern turbofan engine, they're going to get a huge range increase that goes along with that because that's how the technology's matured over the last several decades. And, and you're also looking at um, a sustainment difference, right? Because your mean time between failures and your overhaul rates, talk to us a little bit about that compared with the TF-33. What sort of maintenance time scale, because as a commercial engine, those are staying on the wing a lot longer than anything that's in a military configuration. Yeah. No, absolutely, that's right. So, so the CF-34 today, for example, gets more than 20,000 hours time on wing. <laughs> so, right, in the commercial world, right, they, they fly those engines very hard, very long, and so they've, they've got that durability built in, into them for that specific reason. So we would expect that either a CF-34 or a Passport going on the B-52, that engine would never have to come off wing for scheduled maintenance for as long as the B-52 is in service. And right now, the Air Force Bomber Roadmap says that's through 2050. And under, under either scenario, a CF-34 or a Passport will never come off for scheduled maintenance. There will undoubtedly be some unscheduled maintenance with FOD and ingestion and that kind of thing. But as far as scheduled maintenance and the, the maintenance crews that could be freed up as a result of not having to do that scheduled maintenance over today's engines, is going to have a big impact for the Air Force, and they could redeploy those forces wherever they want to go. Um, sorry, that laugh was um, a, a, a laugh of impressed uh, stupefaction. I'm sorry, 20,000 hours is, well, uh, them's big hours. Um, power by hour, right? I mean, there are those who've said that, hey look, why doesn't the Air Force go to something that's much more of a commercial mindset, you're, you're paying power by hour. Is that still any opportunity to sort of get that kind of a model through, do you think, at the end of the day? I think the Air Force is still considering the sustainment model of what that's going to look like. Um, certainly in the commercial world, that, that's often a, um, a proposal that customers will take. The Air Force, I think, has yet to identify their requirements as far as sustainment goes. Either way, GE is willing to support if they want to do organic or if they want to outsource and, and follow more of a commercial engine model, either one will work. I think the Air Force still has to work out what those requirements look like, but they've got, they could pick from either element, whether they want to do it, I'll say a traditional organic style or a commercial airline kind of outsource style.
Carl Sheldon, Vice President and General Manager of GE's Large Military Aircraft Engines. Thanks very much, Thank man. You. We enjoyed the uh, conversation. And then maybe we can uh, talk about the benefits of can annular and axial engine design at some point and have a little it. clinic. That would be great. Anytime. <laughs> do you think uh, can annular is ever coming back? I do not. <laughs> no, I think those days have, those days have sailed. Thank you.